Rise of Hawk, Part 4, Scene 4. <clears throat> Dober took the colourful ice cream cones from the vendor's hand and turned around, giving one cone to Young Wolf. The boy looked at it as if it were some kind of strange alien insect, and Dober grinned. With a gentle hand on Wolf's back, he led his son away from the dessert truck. They walked up the short rise of a grassy hill and sat down on one of the many park benches that overlooked the field and playground to the south. The boy hadn't touched his dessert. What is it called again, Dad? A triple scoop ice cream cone. The top scoop is citrus, the green is sour drops, and the last one is plain with diced sunkissed fruit. Take a lick, see which one you like. Dober tried his own ice cream as a model for the boy. Wolf cautiously licked the orange scoop on top. He made an appreciative noise and took a bite of the ice cream. It's yum, he said with his mouth full. Dober grinned. <clears throat> a static shiver started deep inside Dober. He frowned, his back straightening as he rode the sensation as best he could. A second later, Wolf's body language mirrored his own. The black static wave bounced between them like a yell inside a cave, magnifying and warping oddly with each reflection. The first piece of knowledge came through to him, and Dobert instinctively sensed that Sharon had just discovered Wolf's deviation in behaviour. He whispered an offensive string of curses. The full force of the static wave hit them both at the same time. It was so strong that young Wolf's hands jolted and the dessert fell from his fingers. In his mind's eye, Dobert saw a familiar place. It was made of grey brick and rusting metal. A place of torture and fear deep in the desert the place Dobin and his sister had been sent when they were young. The vision switched and showed his newly discovered son entering that same terrible building. Wolf's little face was terrified in that place. No. Wolf's voice was barely a... Dobin's voice was barely a whisper. He saw his son being beaten by guards and older kids alike. He saw him weeping in the dark. Tears dropped down Dobin's face as he gritted his teeth against a pulsing, pushing waves of static and visions. The paths and consequences of the situation branched out in his mind, and blessedly, the energy started to fade away again. <clears throat> when the wave had completely dissipated, young Wolf was trembling. Dobert wrapped his arms around the boy's slight shoulders. He shifted his own sadness and fear behind his shielding, leaving only a calm strength for the boy to sense. Wolf climbed up onto his lap, not crying or showing his distress in any other way. He simply closed his eyes and curled up in Dobid's arms. Dobid sensed an innate vulnerability in the boy, which was so intense that he tightened his grip and tucked Wolf's little head under his chin. It sat like that for a long time. Dobid, having learned a little about kids from the rebel children, let Wolf decide how long he needed the hug. Once his trembling stopped, the boy sighed and sat back to look at him. Dobert loosened his hug, but didn't drop his arms. The boy's face was pale, silver eyes were scared but determined. We have to go back now, he said matter-of-factly. Another tear dropped down Dobert's cheek. I know. If I stay with you, Jaren will find us. None of what must happen will happen if we're both dead. Dobert nodded. The boy had seen the same things. Getting to his feet, Dobert lifted his son gently into his arms and spoke mind to mind. You find a high-rating PK kid to befriend, or find a group of kids to join for protection. Keep your head down, don't fight unless you have no choice, and keep safe. I'll come for you. Opening completely to the boy, both empathically and telepathically, so he could see the truth of his words, Dobert continued. I, it will take me a little while to come and get you, but I will. I promise on your mother and grandmother's graves. I will come for you as soon as I possibly can. He paused, swallowing back his grief, and added quietly, And I'm so sorry. Scene 5 <clears throat> Talon stood in the doorway, staring at Dobert across his cathedral office. The man was slumped over his lap, with his forearms resting on his knees. The coloured light from stained glass windows behind him played in the man's light brown hair and across the desk in front of him. Tay sent sorrow. What's wrong? Vivid blue eyes that looked at him were filled with tears. I have a son. His voice wavered and a single tear dropped down his cheek. A nine-year-old son. 
I was told he died with his mother. David wiped his face with one hand. He came here. He found me. We had a perfect morning together. And then they came to take him away. My nine-year-old son is being sent right now to a desert base because he came looking and found me. Another tear dropped. <clears throat> and I can't go and get him without risking everything and everyone. Tay sensed a flicker of rage that turned very suddenly into an inferno. Dobud stood up, lifted a domed paperweight from the desk and threw it against the wall. It shattered on the stone, spreading water and shards of glass everywhere. Must I sacrifice everything? The rule was a little frightening to Tay, because he'd never seen him lose control over anything. But even in his fear, Talon stepped into the room towards him and tried to help. We can find him. The rebels can get him out. Dover's jaw muscle tensed. He looked sideways at Tay. The rage and sorrow fought for prime position in his ice blue eyes. The rebels cannot reach the base he's been sent to. It is an A0 level facility. Even if we could get close to the place, which we can't, it would be too much of a risk to get him out. Logic dictates I cannot sacrifice my cover in the agency or risk sacrificing every single rebel if I got caught just for one person. Sorrow overwhelmed the rage. He sat back down in his chair. His voice was nearly a whisper. Even if that person is my son. Tay didn't know what he could say to comfort such a terrible loss. He stepped closer to Hawk and gently put one hand on his back. Dobud wiped his face and sighed. With time, I can get him out through the normal processes of the agency, but he's going to have to survive until then. Talon sensed a flare of absolute despair. He's only nine years old. Don't you have rights as his father? Can't you insist he's released? He sighed. I do have rights, but I can't cross my father right now. If I publicly defy him on this, I'll lose my position. Then I'll almost certainly be discovered by his... spies. His voice trailed off. Dobud stood up so quickly that Talon flinched. He stared at Tay, but his eyes were unseeing. He must have a spy here. Otherwise, how would he know about Wolf? Talon frowned at the younger man. Your son's name is Wolf? Yes. He waved one hand absently. In the old religion, it was believed that the universe was created by a wolf's howl. It was Sarah's favourite name, and she wanted it for her first child. Dobud grabbed an old brown jacket from the back of his chair and shuffled it onto his shoulders over the black priest robes. There's an envelope for Asha in my top drawer. <clears throat> I need you to leave through the back way and not return until I send a message that it's safe. It's a small mercy that the spy hasn't noticed you yet, but if he does, we'll both be dead. Ye yes, sir, Talon stammered, still confused, as Dobud stalked towards the door. What are you going to do? Toby glanced back at him, and Talon sensed a dangerous rage behind his ice blue eyes. The man's voice was low and hostile. I'm going hunting. Scene 6 <clears throat> Toby crouched in the rafters of the old warehouse, waiting for his father's spy. Storps kept going around, kept going around in torturous circles, distracting him away from the present moment. He kept seeing Wolf's silver eyes staring up at him. The boy had been so intensely vulnerable and helpless. It had taken more discipline than he'd ever needed to not rush forward and defend that helplessness. Dobud's jaw tightened in his rage. He had been forced to betray that protective instinct, forced to be enigma for his father, and forced to watch without emotion as they took his son from him. But Dobud had done what he always did, what was needed, no matter the cost. He knew that if the boy hadn't gone, or if either of them had fought against it, both of their lives would be forfeit. As much as it tortured him, he knew that if he died, the rebels would be lost. Without the rebels to protect the important people, their planet would be ashes. One billion sentient lives lost, if he didn't do what was necessary. He couldn't sacrifice that, even for his son. Wolf would survive. He checked the boy's files. Sharon had started Wolf in the A0 martial arts program at the age of six, instead of the customary age of 11. It was ridiculous for his father to put such a young boy through that level of combat training, but the reality of it was that it meant the boy would be able to look after himself long enough for Dobud to get him out of there. He closed his eyes for a moment and took a deep breath to release the tension in his body and mind. The 
was an emotionally taxing situation to be in, but he would get the boy out when it was safe to do so. Dobert would could easily be killed in the coming conflict if he didn't get a hold of his emotions and his mind. He was too disciplined to let even this affect what must be done. He had to play the part, the game, and be the cold-hearted killer again. Not only to keep up the Enigma persona, but to continue to play his father in the direction he needed him to go. He forced his mind to comply to his will and clear, and clear all thoughts of Wolf out of the way, so he could focus on what was happening in the now. When he opened his eyes again, he was utterly calm and focused. It was sunset outside. Vivid threads of orange light filtered through the windows underneath him and cut fiery lines in the dusty air. Below him, the brick warehouse was empty, except for a single table and chair with a hub laptop and ret retinal ID scanner. It was the nearest agency info drop site to the cathedral. Tobit had accidentally given the spy something to, else to report back to his father. Something juicy that needed to be reported immediately. The youngest son of agency head might be a double spy for the rebels. The corner of Dobit's mouth lifted cynically. It's a shame his father would never know who was going to betray him. Dobit would have loved to see his father's face after such a revelation. There is a wooden creak of a door opening and a foot crunched on the debris-covered floor. Dobid soundlessly secured his footing on the roof beams and aimed his silenced weapon. He fired twice, obliterating the spy's kneecaps and the tender tissue behind them. The man screamed in agony and fell to the dusty concrete. Jumping, Dobid landed lightly while still keeping his weapon aimed at the man's head. He lifted his chin, chin to feign arrogance and lowered his voice in two intimidating gruff gruffness. You made a grave mistake, Agent Garin. The man was whimpering and grasping at his shredded knees, too afraid and in agony to respond. What mistake was that, you might ask? He added Enigma's condescending tone to the gruff hostility in his voice. It wasn't taking the mission, because it was an order and a good agent does as they are ordered. Your mistake was that you didn't come to me first so I could manage what information you gave to my father. If you had done that, you might have survived this mission. He stepped closer, near enough for the man to see him through his agony, but not so close that an errant sweep of a desperate man's arms would knock him to his feet. You are going to die. I promise you that much. But first, you will give me all of the information you pass on to my father, and only when I am satisfied will your suffering cease. He aimed his weapon and two more silent shot, shots took out the man's ability to use his arms. Garin screamed again but did not speak. Dovid knelt over him on the floor, gun pressed against Garin's neck as he dropped his voice back into his own natural cadence. When they find your body, everyone will think you are dead because you crossed Enigma. But I want you to know that you are going to suffer and die horribly, not because you upset me, but because you and you alone sent an innocent nine-year-old boy to a desert training base. Getting to his feet again, Dowd paced around the man, controlling his own personal rage by channeling it into what he was about to do. Now, Karen, you are going to tell me exactly what you have told my father from the moment you arrived at the cathedral two months ago. The faster you give me the information, the less pain you'll experience before you die. The man's dark brown eyes were wide and terrified, but Dobid sensed he was still conscious enough to understand his words and to respond. Garin was choosing not to speak. Dobid put his weapon on the desk next to the immobilized hub and pulled out a knife from one sleeve. You get one warning, and that was it. The man, he stepped over the man and went straight for his left ear. As the blade parted skin, Garin screamed, No, please, no, I'll tell. What do you want to know? 